Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us again for a wonderful episode of Library Lunch and Learn, a midsummer edition. We hope you are all having a wonderful um, summer so far and enjoying the nice weather and all there, uh, that there is that comes with the summer. I know Miriam and I are. Um, and we are really excited today to have a performing arts topic for you all to hear um, so, from some incredible work that's going on in um, the New York Public Library and beyond with books. We have further resources for you, all celebrating the performing arts. And I think that all of us can agree that the one thing we all missed the most during uh, lockdown was um, going to see shows and going to see dancing and going to see anything that was so celebratory like that. So to us, this is even a more special moment um, than it would have been normally. Um, so we're really happy that you're joining us today to hear from wonderful speakers. I'm going to have my colleague Miriam introduce herself and our wonderful librarian that we have today whose last name happens to rhyme with Seaside. We just learned it's Doug Reside and Miriam will introduce him. But I just want to uh, give a few housekeeping tips before we begin. Um, as you all know, uh, you will receive an email after that will have all of the resources and the recording um, and the uh, all the titles that we talk about at the end with our further reading slides. So you don't have to feel like you have to write anything down during the presentation. You can just enjoy yourselves. And again, if you have any questions um, during the during the um, session, just put them in the chat and we will try to um, answer you either um, during the presentation or we will get back to you via email. And as always, we can we like to remind you that you can reach us at library at penguinrandomhouse.com with any questions you might have. Um, so we're so excited for you to be here today. And um, Miriam, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Kelly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this episode of Library Lunch and Learn. Uh, we're, we are truly excited uh, that today's focus will be on the performing arts, and it is both a privilege and a pleasure to introduce our very first distinguished guest from the New York Public Library, Doug Reside is the curator of the Billy Rose Theater Division and manages all aspects of the division's collections and public services. Uh, he joined the New York Public Library in 2011, first as the digital curator for the performing arts before assuming his current position in 2014. Uh, prior to joining the library, he served on the directorial staff of the Maryland Institute for Technology in the Humanities at the University of Maryland. He is currently finishing a book with Oxford University Press on the technologies used to fix the musical in tangible media of expression. Doug received a PhD in English from the University of Kentucky. Welcome, Doug. Hi, Doug. Hey. All right, I'm going to do the technical part of making Doug the presenter and we are going to um, leave it up to all of the librarians to let us know if there's any technical problems because we're not very good at this part. So, <laughs> all right, over to you, Doug. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Just waiting for the share to come up on WebEx. There we go. Doug, just unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> There, great. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the library where I work. Uh, hopefully you're all seeing it now. Um, this is the library for the performing arts. So this is one of the uh, research centers at the in the New York Public Library system. If you're unfamiliar with the, the New York Public Library, we are um, a big uh, public library that circulates books and does all the things that uh, public libraries do throughout the United States and to some extent around the world. Um, but we also have uh, three, at least, of the largest uh, research collections um, in, for our the fields in which we collect. So there's the uh, Schomburg Center for Black History and Culture in Harlem. There's the uh, Schwarzman Building that has uh, some of the greatest humanities collections um, in the world. And then the Performing Arts Library at Lincoln Center is what you see on the screen here. 
So I am uh, the curator, one of the three curators in the division, uh, in the library here. I'm the uh, head of the theater division. We also have curators in dance and in music. Uh, and actually music also includes uh, recorded sound, which doesn't always include uh, performing arts. Sometimes it's speeches and radio broadcasts and that kind of thing. But uh, for the most part, it's theater, music, and dance are collected in, um, in our collections in our library. So I'll just move the slide to the next one. So you can see uh, we are actually, uh, the Library for the Performing Arts is actually unique in the library system in that we are, we serve both the function of being a circulating library and also uh, being a research library. So when you enter, you are greeted with the welcome desk. Uh, and then also you can see over in the corner, there's uh, the places where you can actually check out books. Um, I've been told, and I think it's still true, that we're one of the, if not the second or third, most um, uh, active circulating branches of the 88 plus branches in the New York Public Library system. Uh, we circulate a lot of DVDs actually still. Um, there are folks that still don't have access to or, or just don't can't find what they want on things like Netflix or Hulu or um, what Apple TV. Uh, so they come to the library to check out physical media like CDs and, and DVDs. These are our DVDs. Uh, it's interesting, all of our collections are focused on the performing arts in some way. Uh, so, uh, given that kind of scope restriction that we don't have things like Harry Potter books, unless it's the Harry Potter uh, plays, um, we uh, we're still it's remarkable that we're still as actively used in the library system as we are. There's the CDs that we still uh, circulate. We also have a lot of musical scores, uh, so you can come in and and actually one of the most common. Um, ways that the library, the books in the library are used is someone has an audition for either a play or a, um, a concert piece or something like that. And they come in and they check out the, the books and monologues or the scripts or these scores uh, to play for their, um, their audition or their recitals or whatever else. We also check out uh, and have a, um, a chamber music uh, library. So if you uh, have a small chamber uh, orchestra, you can check out all of the, the parts uh, for a uh, orchestral piece. And uh, we're one of the very, very few places that do that in the, in the United States. Um, before I uh, moved to New York, uh, actually, when I was a very relatively young uh, child, I had the I had actually heard of New York Public Library because of the thing that is sort of seen through that glass in the back of the this photograph, the Theater on Film and Tape Archive. Uh, so we are uh, able through a series of agreements with the unions and guilds that. Um, make theater in New York to go out and film uh, Broadway shows and off-Broadway shows and regional theater and uh, make it available for free to anyone who wants to see it in this archive. Um, the rights are, uh, it was a very complicated system of agreements to make. Um, we, because it's not simply copyright law that we have to uh, deal with, we also have to deal with um, the union agreements, um, the uh, guild agreements, to that each of uh, which is, you know, they're, they're tasked with and do uh, rightly protect the creative work of their, um, of their members. And so back in the uh, late 1960s, uh, there was a real eagerness on the part of some in the theater community, Hal Prince and Roger Stevens and others, to create a video archive that would make it possible to document uh, things like West Side Story. Hal Prince said, you know, unless uh, Jerome Robbins does West Side Story again at some point in the future, all of that dance, which was, and as you probably know, it is very much part of the story of West Side Story, will be lost. And so there's no real documentation of West Side Story. And so uh, Hal was writing to folks, telling people that they should really uh, support the creation of this video archive. And then around 50 years ago, we actually just today are opening an exhibition about the 50 years of the theater on film and tape archive. A woman named Betty Corwin uh, volunteered at the library to try to finally realize this dream that so many have had of being able to capture uh, theater live performance um, and make it available uh, in this in this archive. Um, she uh, originally got permission mostly from the off-Broadway uh, performers where they, the union, there were fewer unions to convince. And so our first, uh, the first play that we, or the first theater piece that we added to this collection was a Japanese rock opera called The Golden Bat in uh, 1970. But since then, uh, we've uh, that he finally got permission to record uh, um, Liza Minnelli uh, in one of her uh, performances on Broadway at the Palace Theater. And since then, uh, really since the, at least the 1980s, 
we've been regularly recording both Broadway and off-Broadway theater. And there's now over 4,000 uh, theater productions in the Theater on Film and Tape archive. We also do interviews uh, with uh, notable theater personalities. And in fact, Liza Minnelli was one of those interviews in the 70s. And that experience doing the interview was one of the things that led her to um, want to give permission to record her show at the Palace, which then opened up the doors of Broadway for us. Um, over the pandemic, we have been able to begin to clear the rights for some of the interviews that we've done. And so there's um, a couple of dozen uh, of these interviews. They're, they have the title, The Creative Process, that we've been able to uh, make available online in our digital collections. And also uh, we stream them on our YouTube uh, channel, uh, or on, uh, sorry, on our uh, Zoom channel um, regularly uh, as the sort of first showing of these of these interviews from the collection. And then we try to make them available um, to anyone through our, our digital images. Um, I thought uh, because uh, it's always interesting to see how another library organizes itself and and presents its work to the public. I thought we, we could take just a quick uh, look at what I tell people whenever they come to, to ask for materials in the collection and try to figure out how to use the library. So I know most of you are librarians and a lot of this is probably very familiar, um, but I, I just wanted to show kind of the different ways into the collection. Um, so so that maybe you can even point your own users uh, to use some of the materials that we make available. So ways to search our collection. So um, like, um, well, maybe unlike most libraries now, we have we still have uh, catalog cards. So there is material that is still only described on uh, cards that look like that. These little um, index cards that are in the drawers that many of us probably recognize from our youth, but um, are now uh, something of a relic in uh, library history, library technology. Uh, so I always encourage people if they're on site to take a look at the cards. They're organized um, by individuals and by show names. So basically. Uh, proper names uh, within the collection. The things that are that might only be on catalog cards are usually uh, ephemeral things. You can see there's a uh, clippings file for Dream Girls. Um, there, the uh, the our clippings files were started really when the theater division started in 1931, maybe even a little bit before. And they are just these, as the name sort of suggests, they're these folders and file cabinets that have uh, that are stuffed with um, uh, newspaper and magazine clippings and sometimes press releases. Uh, there's the occasional, um, uh, you know, promotional handout uh, that just, you know, accreted over time over the last hundred or so years. And they really are amazing files. Um, there's often folks, you know, I, I, as you heard from my bio, I come to libraries through digital humanities. So I'm very much committed to the, um, the accessibility and affordances that digital technology make available. But I do think that these clippings files, people sometimes will say that, well, isn't everything in the clippings files online? And first of all, it, it isn't. I mean, there's often uh, journals and magazines that haven't been digitized or at least aren't easily available through um, a free Google search or whatever. Um, but in other cases, while they might be, many of the articles might be in ProQuest databases or um, in JSTOR or something like that, or in the New York Times database, having all the files gathered together in one central place is really an amazing resource. And so it's um, maybe of no surprise that our clippings files are always the, by far the most accessed uh, collections in our special collections. And also the, the programs are inter uh, filed in there too. And those um, in many cases are only described on the catalog cards. So if you want to look at um, our files and you can't get to the catalog cards, there's, there's really, a couple of different ways. You can always call a library and ask them to check. We have been uh, digitizing the catalog cards, just essentially taking pictures through a uh, a fancy machine that we have to scan catalog cards and then uh, making them available as we can through um, Google Drive sharing, that kind of thing. And then uh, we're also trying to, as we can, retrospectively uh, convert the information on the cards to our online catalog. But also, if you're interested, let's say, in Dream Girls, uh, and you ask for the clippings file on Dream Girls, you're probably going to get something. Um, we have, if there's a show that, or a person who was involved in theater who uh, worked in New York in the last hundred years, it's a fairly good wager to say that um, you would find a clippings file on, or a program file on either of those, uh, those people or their shows. So uh, we often just tell people put in the put say you want the clippings file on Dream Girls and we'll go look to see if we have one. We also have like you know every uh, contemporary library uh, the catalog 
um, we've recently separated. So there's different, the, the complication of, of having a library system that has both a really active um, circulating library and also a, a huge research library just presents problems for uh, trying to find ways of giving search results that people want. And so in the early days of electronic catalogs, we had a separate uh, research catalog and a separate circulating catalog and we combined them um, a couple of maybe 20 years or so ago. And now uh, we found that um, the way that people are using the library today has made it um, more worthwhile to or, or more useful to separate the catalogs again. So the, the research catalog is just at catalog.nypl.org. And this catalog searches um, not just the special collections that I was talking about, things like the, the archival papers or the TOFT, the theater on film and tape videos, or the, um, the clippings files, uh, but it, they also will search the books. So a lot of the books that you um, saw, or that you, the, the book that we're hearing about today, the Balanchine book, um, would likely be in our research collection. It might also be in our circulating collection, but we will keep um, we keep one copy, uh, sort of without circulating it, of most of the major scholarly works um, on theater, dance, and music uh, in the research collection. And so you can search those in this catalog. The archives portal, which is archives.nypl.org. I should also say all of these sites that I'm pointing to, you can get to just from nypl.org. But again, the, the challenge of a big institution that, that serves a lot of different audiences means that the website can sometimes be a little hard to navigate. So the direct links are sometimes good just to know. So the archives portal is a tool that will search all of the inventories or the finding aids, if you know the term of art, uh, for the um, the collections that we have in all of the collections of the New York Public Library. Um, so one of my the jobs that uh, you know, the primary part of my job really is to go out and find and add new archival collections to um, the holdings and the theater division. So in the last two years, because of the pandemic, we've sort of put a pause on acquiring, but that's just beginning to thaw, and uh, we're starting to collect things again. But even during the pandemic. Um, there were some things that were sort of underway and then came into the library. So Carol Channing, uh, the famous Broadway actor who played uh, Dolly Levi and Hello Dolly for years and years and years. Um, she, when she died, uh, she, uh, her will gave all of the material, all of the archival material to the New York Public Library. And so that's now available and processed and anyone can look at scripts for Hello Dolly um, or will soon be processed. I think that one's actually just, just about to be uh, available. We also have the Fringe Festival, the New York Fringe Festival was another collection that I just recently brought in. I was working on it uh, right when everything shut down and we were able to bring it in finally during the pandemic. So that's a, a huge collection of all of the applications that um, uh, and, and production files for shows that performed in the New York Fringe Festival. If you know the musical that has since become kind of a, um, a regional favorite, Urin Town, uh, that was a uh, Tony nominated show uh, about 20 years ago. It, uh, it started at the French Festival, actually. So you can see the work to develop that piece from its very earliest idea to one of its you know, a very early rudimentary production at the French. Um, we have the papers of Harold Prince, who I mentioned before, Joseph Papp, who uh, created the public theater and ran that for years and years. We actually have the records of the public theater as well. Um, we're very strong in photographs and in designs. So we have um, most of the major collections of theater photography, or most of the, the collections, the archives, of most of the major theater photographers from the last century in our holdings. Um, most recently, we acquired the papers and the photographs of Joan Marcus, who has photographed just about everything from 1990 to today, and Carol Russig, who is sort of her counterpart and off-Broadway. Uh, the two of them actually shared a studio, and so in 2018, I, after a, a lot of kind of conversation with both of them, we finally went and picked up their material and it's now all been processed and is available um, on uh, at, at the library. The um, th oh, this is a example of what one of the finding aids would look like. So this is Harold Prince's papers. This is just the very top. It's a giant collection um, over well over 100 boxes. I think it's almost 400 boxes actually. Um, these, this is the start of that box one, which contains his correspondence. And you can see it's his correspondence to people whose names begin or whose last names begin with the letter A. Um, so you can find letters to, for instance, that last thing on there is Boris Aronson, who is the designer of Follies and Company and a little night music and uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And you can see um, their conversations as they try to think about how to design and get the, the iconic look that these shows eventually had. 
Um, we also have been uh, making material online for almost 20 years now in various ways. Um, when I first came to li the library, there was a, uh, an application called Digital Gallery, and we, uh, working with a, um, a digital humanities group that was at the library at the time called uh, NYPL Labs, they uh, recreated uh, Digital Gallery as a new kind of slightly newer site digital collection, which is now nearly 10 years old. And so we're in the process of kind of rethinking that. Um, but in digital collections, you can actually see um, this, that, that number of 800 something thousand there is actually really low. Uh, now we have close to almost a million items in digital collections. And a lot of that material is actually related to the performing arts. Uh, we've been able to digitize the uh, photographs of um, people like Martha Swope and Friedman Abels and Florence Van Damme, who documented theater in the 20th century. And just very recently, I received funding um, from a couple of different people to begin to digitize all of the color slides in the Friedman Abels collection. And so uh, a lot of these things were never printed because printing and distributing color was so expensive in the 20th century. Um, but now that we're able to digitize them and make them available digitally, you can see uh, what the costumes looked like in the original 1966 production of um, Cabaret or the uh, original color of Jamaica in 1957. And just and a lot of these photographs are photographs that I've seen before in black and white, um, but to see them in color is uh, kind of breathtaking and really rel relevatory uh, to understanding the design of these shows from the mid and actually in some cases kind of early 20th century. There's photographs from our Martha Swift collection of Annie uh, we have, um, you can see there, it says there's uh, 923 results in just the Martha Swift collection. So 923, uh, 23 photographs of, Mar of uh, from Martha Swift that have, well, that have the word Annie in it. Um, but a lot of those uh, photographs are actually of the production of Annie and the many, many um, actors who uh, played a role in Annie. You can see actually a very young Jess uh, Sarah Jessica Parker as Annie in one of those, those photographs. Um, we also uh, regularly publish uh, blogs, uh, I guess, like a lot of institutions do. Um, what's kind of interesting is the blogs are also a place where we can very quickly showcase some of the material that uh, we've not yet been able to get in digital collections. So this past year, I did a blog series where I tried to look at everything that we had in the archives related to revivals of shows that happened on Broadway. And sometimes that work that um, just putting the blog entries together uh, led me to discover really interesting things. Um, so, for instance, the, uh, the play Trouble in Mind by Alice Childress opened on um, Broadway really for the first time. It had a kind of troubled uh, journey to Broadway from 1957 to today. It has had a lot of productions before it got to the Roundabout Theater. But using the collections at the Schomburg Center, uh, who, which preserves the papers of Alice Childress and a, lo a lot of her collaborators, I really learned a lot about uh, the people that were involved in that first production and the really interesting stories um, that really haven't been told yet. So these blogs are sometimes a place where um, library staff can kind of share the discoveries that, that we are making when we look through our, um, our collections and share those with the public. Oh, I guess I should say the blog series that's on the screen right now is a series that I used to run. I haven't done it in a while. It used to be called Musical of the Month. Um, but it was an opportunity to make available uh, libretti, so the scripts of musicals that were not otherwise easily available. So I started with um, with public domain shows, and then I started to get permission from people like Sheldon Harnick and um, Otto Harbach's estate and folks like that to make these uh, more recent uh, musicals available. So you can actually read um, uh, several uh, scripts of Showboat on there uh, that I was able to put up with permission. Uh, from the, the very earliest um, versions of that show. Um, we also have, and this, uh, the look and feel of this website has changed a little bit uh, since I took this screenshot, um, but uh, we have a really fairly robust um, collection of articles and databases uh, that anyone in, that has a New York public, li public library card can use. So what's great is if you um, are an independent scholar. So I, as I think uh, someone said at the beginning of the, the Miriam said at the beginning of this talk, I've just almost ready to submit a book um, that I've been researching and a large part of it I researched during the pandemic on the ways that musical theater, uh, the musical theater canon was shaped by technologies of the 20th century. And I was so happy that I had access. I, you know, I'm not associated with a, um, a university anymore. So I, but I, because of the, because of living in New York, like anyone, not because I'm a staff member, but just because I'm a citizen of New York, uh, New York State, 
I was able to access the, the databases um, that are really on par with, with a good university library um, set of research databases. So you can access things like back issues of Variety, um, the, uh, the various academic journals, that kind of thing um, online. I, most of Oxford University Press's uh, books are um, academic books are available as full text uh, in the um, one of their databases. And there are ways actually, if you come to the library, even if you aren't a New York public library um, or New York state citizen, that you can get um, library cards that have a shorter lifespan, uh, but which you can use for a while once you, uh, once you come. So anyone, if you make it to physically to the, the, the building, um, you can get a library card and that will give you access for a, a certain period of time. I also just wanted to quickly say that we are so happy that uh, a couple of I guess it's almost now a year and a half ago we got um, a we got funding from Harvey Firestein to the actor and writer who is represented by uh, Penguin Random House in his recent um, uh, autobiography uh, to um, create what we're calling a, a theater lab and so we're still in the process we're working with the uh, scenic designer David Rockwell to design the space. Um, but we're uh, trying to figure out how to make this into a, a space that's kind of what Harvey talks about in his book, a, um, a something like that, what used to be the basement of La Mama or the basement of the drama bookshop, where artists can put together um, and showcase work that is still very much under development. Um, we're also hoping to add some tools for emerging scenic designers and lighting designers to uh, have access to the kinds of technology they might have if they were working with a major design studio which if they're just getting started, they may not have um, or even know about, and we'll try to provide some training on that as well. Um, we also have lots of exhibitions and programs. We just, as I said, opened today an exhibition on 50 years of the Theater on Film and Tape collection. We have a, uh, a, a, a huge exhibition on Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground right now in our largest gallery. And um, I'm about to put in a exhibition on um, the uh, costume designer Willa Kim uh, in uh, the early part of next year. And we have uh, public programs um, every week. Uh, one of the public programs that I'm really excited about that also just started again is a summer program for musical theater writers where anyone can join, you don't have to have any credentials or ever have written anything before, but you come to the this program, the first one was this past Saturday, you meet other writers, you decide to write a musical together. So composers meet lyricists and they both meet performers and book writers, and then over the course of the summer, they write a 20 minute musical with feedback from um, experts in the industry like David Henry Long or um, uh, Janine Tesori, uh, Susan Birkenhead, have, uh, they're all getting feedback this, this year. And, uh, and then like, we present the final works this, this year, it'll be on November 19th, where each of the um, uh, groups get to show off the 20 minute musical that they wrote during the course of the summer. Um, so I think actually I'm running short on time, so I'm going to end uh, there. But if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer any. Or if not, uh, you can contact me at um, trivia information. We go out, but it's my name, Doug Reside at nypl.org. Stop sharing. We do have um, one. We have two questions that we um, want to ask. One is um, we had a couple of people ask about um, being able to access New York Public Library if they're not in New York, is it possible to get a library? How does the New York Public Library work as far as their um, library cards when they're outside of New York? Yeah, so, um, so the, if you make it to the library and you get a card, it will last for a little while beyond that. But yeah, if you're not in New York State or one of the state, the kind of metropolitan region that we have agreements with, um, there's not an immediately good way to get uh, access to that. Um, so, yeah, so you, you can have a library card, even if you don't live in New York, um, but you have to come to the building to get it, I guess is the, is the answer. Um, so people have to come visit your library. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Shucks. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other, as I see the question about the access to viewing things that are on site only, um, we are really trying to make uh, things as available as possible. In fact, we just got a funding from the Leon Levy Foundation to try to, um, go to rights holders directly and ask them for permission to share things um, more widely than we have uh, right now. So there's some things that we know people that like most of the theater and film and tape archive, we know that the, the unions and guilds explicitly don't want most of that content to go beyond um, the walls of the library. But in other cases, if we could find all the rights holders, they're often fine with us sharing. I mean, the, the musical of the month blog is an example of that where I just needed to ask and people said, yeah, please do it. So, um, this grant will hopefully at least 
give us a person, I mean, it will give us a person to go out and ask, to find who we need to ask and ask them. And hopefully that will lead to more of that content being available um, beyond the walls of the library. But yeah, right now there's not, it, the, the access that you see on digital collections is basically the extent of what we've been allowed to, to grant within the, the boundaries of copyright law. Got it, thank you. And one other question we have is, um, what have you found is best recommended resource for aspiring performers? And have you come across Broadway actors and directors uh, using your vast resources resources when doing your own research? I, 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 that is a good question, especially since they can go back now and see what the costume used to look like in color. That's amazing. And what a wonderful um, benefit for the costume designers way back then to finally have their yeah. moment to kind of. <laughs> Yeah, so there's there's uh, color photographs. They're available uh, anywhere in the world, so you can just click on digital collections and look for them there. Um, but yes, uh, the the costume bibles, let's say, of uh, someone like Willa Kim or Patricia Ziprot or um, who else? Uh, Anhold Ward. Uh, these are all major costume designers of the last um, well, the last fifty years. Um, they, we have we actually have their designs too uh, here physically. And we do see designers and actors and directors coming to look at things all the time. Um, you know, like like most libraries, we try to protect patron privacy no matter who they are. Um, so I don't want to name anybody specifically, but um, yeah, there are there are regularly if you visit our reading room, basically on any day, and you're really good at recognizing faces, you'll probably see somebody whose work you've you've seen before or know of. Even another better another good reason to visit your library. Doug, thank you so much. That was really fun. Um, that was really inspiring and fun and so chock full of knowledge. And we really appreciate your time today. And again, um, all of you that are out there, we'll be sending you as much of uh, Doug's presentation that we can based on rights and, and copyright issues and stuff like that. But also, I'm sure Doug will be available for some questions. If you have them, you can send them through us and, and we'll make sure you get, get the answers that you're looking for. But we really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give, I'll pass the um, screen control over to you. All right, thanks and take care. Thank you. And I'm coming in, I have, I'm a good stalker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, everybody just give me one second of uh, time to get our author and our moderator back up on um, the screen here and Sorry, and then I will be with you in a sec and we'll introduce them. And Okay. Well, sorry. You'd think all these years in, I'd be um, quicker at this stuff. Okay, so David and Jennifer, you should be back on and you can put your cameras back on if you'd like. And hold on one second here. Sorry, one of these, as soon as I get uh, good at this, um, We'll be back to regular life and I won't have to do this anymore. So <laughs> actually, I'm just kidding. We hope this never goes away. We love being able to meet with all of you from out of state. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna do a quick introduction. We're so excited for our author part of the presentation. David and Jennifer, thanks for being so patient. I'm just gonna give you guys the a proper introduction that you deserve since you're both so accomplished. Um, David Ebershoff is editor-in-chief of Hogarth and the executive editor of Random House. He's edited, he's edited books that have won the Pulitzer in uh, fiction, biography, and history, and uh, more than 25 New York Times bestsellers. As we like to say in our department, we know if David has anything to do with a book, we first of all definitely want to read it, and second, we know that it's going to be wonderful. Um, his own novels have included The Danish Girl, which was adapted into an Oscar-winning film, and the number one bestseller, The 19th Wife. Jennifer Holmans is the dance critic for The New Yorker. Her widely acclaimed Apollo's Angels, A History of Ballet, was a bestseller and named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review. Trained in, uh, she was trained in dance at George um, Ballantyne School of American Ballet. She performed professionally with Chicago Lyric 
Opera Ballet and the Pacific Northwest Ballet. She earned a, her BA at Columbia University and her PhD in Modern European History at New York University, where she is a distinguished scholar in residence and the founding director of the Center for Ballet and the Arts. Based on a decade of unprecedented research, Mr. B is the first major biography of George Ballantyne, a broad uh, canvas portrait set against the backdrop of the tumultuous century that shaped the man the New York Times called the Shakespeare of Dancing. And as a person who has taken one bar class in her life and nearly died the day after, I am thrilled and honored and um, so happy that both of you are here today to talk about this wonderful book. So over to both of you. Okay. David, can we hear you? Doesn't look like you're muted, but I can't hear you. Let's see. Let's see. How about now? Hmm. Jennifer, what about you? hear me i can hear you but david i can't hear you but it doesn't look like you're muted so is your audio connected maybe we're working on it <laughs> to reconnect my audio so maybe that has to we'll figure it out it always works out <laughs> We didn't have technical problems. It wouldn't be a, a live it wouldn't broadcast. be 2022, right? <laughs> Let's see. Um, he's not blah. I have no idea. Let's see. You're not muted on your computer, are you? Hmm. David, I hate to. Let's just delay for one second. What if you do you want to try just dialing back in maybe? Okay, hold on a sec. All right. Um, all right, let's give him one second to come back. We'll be right back. Sorry, everybody you can stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I can fill in a little bit by following up with uh, with what Doug said. Just I was so moved by thinking about um, how much time I spent in the performing arts collection at the New York Public Library. Just hours and hours of doing research. Oh, that's wonderful to hear how practical of the information is. And yeah, yeah. And in fact, the cover comes is a Martha Swope image that I think you can find online in the digitized collection. <laughs> so. That's, that's, oh, that's really, see, that's perfect. What a perfect um, marriage of speakers today. You now, how about now, now David? There yeah. you go. All right. Okay. <laughs> I, I, Sorry about I, that. I swear it was not a mute button. It was, it was telling me to connect, but there was no way to connect. I apologize um, for that, but let's just jump in because. Yes, I'm really, and I will, I'm, I will see you guys in a little <laughs> bit. Enjoy your conversation. And okay. like I said, Thank we're so happy you're here today. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Th Thank you for having us and thank you for everyone attending. Um, librarians are among my favorite people because they probably, and you all probably love books as much as we do, maybe even more. And so it's an honor to be able to spend some time in, with, with you and, and to talk with Jennifer about her amazing book. I just want to say like two, a couple fast things and then I have questions for Jennifer because Mr. B is so much fun to talk about and so interesting. But as you heard, Jennifer is many things. She's a former professional dancer. She's a historian with a PhD in history. She's a critic and dance critic at the New Yorker. But most important, at least to me, she's a writer. And she has now written two monumental books about ballet. The first was Apollo's Angels that came out um, a few years ago and was one of the 10 best books of the year, according to the New York Times Book Review. And now we have Mr. B, George Balanchine's 20th Century. And this is a superb 
book. And I, there's just one thing I want to say about it that like really feels perhaps captures how excellent this is. Jennifer has done for George Balanchine what Robert Caro has done for Lyndon Johnson. It's that kind of biography with that kind of scope and that kind of writing. So welcome, Jennifer. Oh, thank you That's, uh, for that lovely introduction. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Let's let's just jump in. I think, you know, to start, would you remind us who George Balanchine was, not just his biographical sketch, but how influential he was, not only in ballet, but in the culture at large for some 50 years in the 20th century, and how significant his legacy remains today. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is an extraordinary man and an extraordinary story. He, he was a Russian-born choreographer, born in 1904 in the imperial system, and um, he's probably the greatest choreographer of the century, certainly one of them, and maybe even of all time, really an, a, a changed the world of dance forever and participated in changes in the world of culture that have affected all of us. And I, let me just say a little about what those are. Um, you know, he was Russian born during the imperial period. He lived through the revolution, through the First World War. And we we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but um, moved to Europe in 24, just as Lenin was coming to power and then was in Europe in the interwar period and working with Diaghilev and sort of traveling all over Europe, so absorbing everything around him. Um, went into eventually, and you know, he was in exile. He never went back to Russia except uh, to visit and moved to New York in 1933 at the bequest of Lincoln Kirstein, who's another big character in the story. And all of the, and then he stayed in New York and founded the New York City Ballet in 1948 and really just changed the cultural world of New York and of the United States. He, um, the, the revolution of dance itself took it from really a kind of older, it was beginning to change fairy tale art into something that was more like a kind of art form you would see from Picasso or here in the music of Stravinsky. Um, it began with a sort of re-engineering of the human body. You know, if you think about the change that in the 20th century from those long dresses where women in particular could move very little corseted and then all of a sudden there's this, this absolute reform of the, of the female body. And he was really part of that. And um, so he freed the body and he made movement larger, faster, bigger. Um, he was very interested in speed and the machine and in remaking the, the body so it could do, do more, physically do more. Um, but a machine that thinks, so a machine, as he put it, that, so a machine that has a kind of emotional life and a, and a deep um, capacity. He was very interested in abstraction and stripping away the, you know, the sets, the costumes, all of the, the sort of spectacle that you think of with ballet and having that human body really shown in all of its glory and all of its beauty. Um, he was an institution builder. He built the New York City Ballet. He established ballet across the country. He seeded the whole sort of landscape. So things that you see today are most likely things that he had a hand in. Um, his dances are performed still. He made you know, over 400 dances, about about 100 or so, a little less, are, are still existing. And you, those are danced by dancers all over the world. So his legacy is is sort of huge in ways you don't see in terms of his effect on the on the body itself and how we understand the body, and then in his glorious work, which is widespread. And he was at, in his lifetime. He was uh, one of just the great artistic figures that that went well beyond the world of dance into all kinds of culture, art, as you 
said, politics even, um, and he just was a sort of a one of the one of the the greats, one of the the titans of culture of the 20th century. Yeah, he had a kind of um, a vast, you know, just like all of these geniuses, a vast mind, and he was. He was, you know, the thing I discovered in all of this research, which took me in so many directions, that he was deeply interested in art, and that affected the way he he worked. He read literature from the Bible to Goethe to um, Cervantes to Shakespeare to you know to to modern literature, and he he was also he did a lot of work in film. He did a lot of work on Broadway. He was kind of everywhere. He was uh, everywhere. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a quick question in the chat, which is when does the book publish? It, it goes on sale on November 1st, um, and it will be out in the world and you'll be hearing a lot about it in the lead up to November 1st and thereafter. And we also encourage anyone who's tuning in to, to, um, ask us questions. We're happy to answer them. Jennifer, could you tell us the origin story of Mr. B? Um, where this where this began for you and how you ended up uh, spending a decade of your life um, thinking about writing about George Balanchine. Yeah, I mean, you know, after Apollo's Angels came out, I had a very sort of, um, well, even before Apollo's Angels came out, but I had very difficult, it was very personal for me because I had, um, you know, my husband had contracted ALS, um, and if you, you don't know what that is, it's something, it's a terrible, terrible disease that really robs you of all of your, it robs you of your body. So the thing that was in my life very, very important, I watched my husband be robbed of his body and then of his life. And so when he died, um, which is obviously a great tragedy for our family, but um, I was in grief and I lost my parents at the same time. So I was really in grief and I was also, you know, still a writer and trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I was just drawn back again and again to Balanchine. I knew his dances because I had been, as, as you mentioned, a professional dancer myself, and I had trained at his school and I had watched him work and I had seen and performed many of his, many of his ballets. So I knew that there, I think what I was drawn to was the, 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 the tremendous beauty and life in them, just like the highest forms of life in these dances. And then also the, the great loss that he, that was constantly expressed in them. And so, you know, I, I took it up because I knew something about it. And because it seemed to me a little bit, I think of it sometimes like, I think I've said this to you before, David, it's like a little bit like falling in love, you know, you sort of do it and you don't know why. And then it takes you years and years to figure out how you ended up with this person. And there I was with Mr. B, you know, <laughs> and it took me years to understand that. The, and I, yeah. my instincts weren't wrong. I mean, there was a deep, deep uh, experience and feeling of loss that he went through. And, um, and then there was this enormous beauty that he made out of it. So that's, that's sort of where I started. And then once I committed, I, I, I just dove in. You just said the years and years. Um, so I'd love you to tell us a little bit about that. I 10 years researching and writing more than a hundred interviews, um, but also lots and lots of work in archives at libraries with collections. Could I, I would love to hear about that. Um, and if you have a story about um, a certain collection, a certain archive that was really important to your work or, or, or others, uh, or many um, archives that probably were important to the work. Yeah, no, I mean, I did, um, as you said, the research was, was I was quite obsessed. And so I, I spent pretty much all the time that I had um, on, in libraries and tracing his path, you know, traveling to various cities and walking his his path so that I could see what it felt like and talking to, as you said, I, I mean, I interviewed well over 100 people, many of them many times. 
so that I could understand what this experience had been like. But I'm a historian and I, I, you know, memory is terrific and amazing and beautiful and very revealing, but it, it doesn't tell you what happened <laughs> always. So I depended a lot on archives and, you know, I used archives all over the United States, all over Europe, all over, um, not all over Russia, but in Russia and in Georgia, where his family was originally from. Uh, Georgia, not the state, but the country. And so, you know, one, just for example, you know, his papers are held at Harvard at the Houghton Library, which is a, a beautiful place to work. And I found there some notes on choreography that were really just scraps because, you know, one of the things that um, made me so reliant on libraries and on, on archivists and librarians is that Valentin didn't like to keep things. And so he, he, he didn't, he believed in the present moment. He didn't believe in the past. He didn't collect his own work, his own writings, anything, you know, he left very little. So the people who knew him were the ones that I was after a lot of the time. And so, you know, in this archive, there are these little scraps of notes about his choreographic method, which is something that was incredibly valuable to me. And it took me, you know, there was a phrase in these notes that took me, I, I looked at it and I thought, well, that's Spinoza, isn't it? Right. And so yeah. then I ended up, you know, in the library again, but reading about Spinoza and, and, and asking for books, you know, who, how could I educate myself on this? And so there was that. There were also, for another example, you know, just heartbreaking love letters that um that are unpublished and haven't been used before at least that i'm aware of and they're just you know they were written by him in his hand to both his third wife and his fifth wife and yes there were five wives um so you know in this broken english that gives you just a really strong feel for who he was and how he was thinking in a way that you can't get from from a memory or a or a secondhand account. Did you feel as you were doing your research and interviewing people or, or uh, showing up at archives, talking to the archivist, the librarian, that people were waiting for you in the sense that they were waiting for the book to be written, a writer who had the, the time and the ambition and the historical background and also the personal background as a dancer who could kind of after all that he was? Yeah, I, you know, I felt just enormous eagerness on the part of all, I mean, I just, it's, I'm, I, I have such admiration for, for this calling is really is what it is because the, the dedication to knowledge and to helping someone like me who, who doesn't and can't know the depth of the archive and can't know the, the even where you know i've had archives be pointed out to me that i didn't know existed you know and the, and so those things are, are it's it's really a reminder that a book is involves so many people in its making it has one writer but these people are all in the in the you know to use that old metaphor in the village that that really writes the book and it starts right there in the in the libraries for sure. The the book subtitle is George Balanchine's 20th century and um why did you settle on that subtitle? What does that um what does that mean? I mean partly it's a reference to um I mean he was born in 1904, he died in 1983, he lived the 20th century and he traveled to all of the he seemed to be present at many of its most, um, you know, astonishing moments. He was there for, for uh, the the First World War in Russia. He was a child, and he was a a very you know a sort of young man during the revolution. And he was pulled into the whole revolutionary environment and art. And he suffered greatly too. He was very ill. He was starving. He was you know, 
searching for food and eating horses and rats and these kinds of stories that you that come out of these very violent situations and he he then went into exile and he lived in in Europe for a while but when Hitler was coming to power in 33 that's when he ended up leaving not only for that reason and not primarily for that reason even um but but he did leave and then he ends up in America in, during the the sort of American century in art and it's so it it really is a a way in which he, and he, you know he was a, a kind of person who watched everything around him he was a real observer and he absorbed so i think he is a kind of composite of many of the both art movements but also the the ethos and political events of the of this century so that was the the sort of primary reason the secondary reason is is a little bit more poetic but not really it has to do with the fact that he invented his own 20th century and this has to do with his background which is that he lived through that russian revolution boy that's a formative moment and <clears throat> It was a materialist revolution, right, as we know, and he set out in his life to make a spiritual revolution. And that's what he was doing in New York, is trying to build a different 20th century of spirit and art and beauty. And he was obviously a very, uh, he wasn't a white Russian because he wasn't of that aristocratic class, but he was a white Russian in his politics. So he was always fighting the Cold War, always. Right. And that's how he did it. Uh, maybe one more question. Um, and then if there's other que the questions from the audience, but there's a, another quick question in, in the chat. Uh, does the book include pictures? Yes, it does. Uh, <laughs> more than 100, right, Jennifer? That's it. <laughs> Thank you. For, and, and David made that possible. So Many of them never published before. Yeah. Many of them never published before. Um, some of them archival. Some of them, um, many of them of him. You know, of 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 who he was. I really tried to get inside him. And there's also a very, you know, a lot of them are in rehearsals and in um, in sort of the making of the dances. Knowing that that anyone who wishes to can go see the the dances or see photographs of them online easily. But these are not so accessible. And I think they give a, a, a little bit of a portrait of him in images. That gets me to my last question for you. Um, you were previously just talking about the 20th century and in many ways you were sounding like the historian that you are and your PhD, as I mentioned, is in modern European history. And yet you were also a professional dancer. I cannot imagine that there's anyone really more qualified to write this book than you. One of the most special parts of the book is when you take us inside the dances. And by this, I mean, you write in a way in certain passages um, that describes what it feels to dance these dances, to be the ballerina, to be the dancer. And it is remarkable prose. It's remarkable writing. It's something I've never really seen before done um, in nonfiction. Um, could you just talk a little bit about doing that, but also just what it means to you to have come from your, your early adult life when you were a professional dancer to now be writing about this um, titan of, of the world of dance and ballet? I mean, look, you know, to, to sort of um, start with your last question, you know, is it, 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 it feels like it's, it, I mean, I, you know, I ended up by chance, of course, you know, in New York when I was a teenager in the mid 70s, when Balanchine was still alive and the work was still being performed under his auspices and and then I was at his school, so I was just immersed. I mean, I would go to class all day and then I would go to the theater at night, every night. And it was it, practically every night. And it, so it was just a, a, an extraordinary experience for me. And so to return to it now and to have the opportunity, I felt so um, 
you know, such a, it was such a privilege to be able to, to learn about him and to really dive deeply and discover lots of things about him and also to follow him. It was a, an enormous education for me. So, so that part was, was wonderful. The dances are to me, of course, why we care so much about him. So I wanted to make sure they were very much a part of the fabric of the, um, of the book without being reductive about it and saying, oh, you know, you can see the life because you can see the dances, but trying to integrate them into his life and, and to do it in a way that it's hard to write about dance, I find, because you don't, you don't want to bore people and you don't want to just describe something that they can't see. So I thought, well, maybe I can sort of transmute myself into the dancer and then describe what that is and describe how it might have felt and then sort of move back and forth between those two positions of of someone who sees and someone who does and which has kind of been my life practicing mm -hmm. that so, so i've tried to do i tried to do that and i'm glad if it if it succeeded and there's some way in which we you know i see dance in a way as a history of ideas so if you can get inside the dance you can sort of see peel back the ideas and see you know what was that what does it not what does it mean but what what is it yeah yeah i think uh we're probably running out of time but jennifer thank you so much for talking today and also just a big congratulations on Mr. B. This is really an exceptional biography and it's it's for even if someone doesn't think of themselves as a ballet nut, like they will love this book. It's for anyone who loves the intersection of history, politics, culture, art, and of course dance and ballet. So congratulations, Jennifer, and, and thank you for being here. Thank you. And thank you, David, for everything that you've done. And I just also want to thank the audience for listening. I always feel badly that I can't see you all, really. And um, but I'm immensely grateful for you to, for listening today and for for um, for your interest in the book. That was wonderful. Remind everybody um, some of the um, some of the other questions that are coming privately. If you want to just remind everybody when the book is on sale, because I think You've definitely captivated this audience with this, um, with this story. November 1st. Yeah, we can't wait. And David, I love how you said um, that the, did you feel like the people were, the librarians were waiting for you, to, for her to come and write this story? I, I, what a wonderful way to actually end this program because in the beginning of the program, when we were listening to Doug talk about all the amazing archives, it does make you wonder if the librarians are looking through it thinking, oh, somebody come and discover this. So it must have been a wonderful uh, thing for the librarians as well for you to have discovered all of these wonderful um, letters and, and accounts of his life. And gosh, Jennifer, with your personal story and your professional career and your background in history, you're right, David, I can't think of anybody else that would have been able to write the, this book. And as readers and as um, people that work with librarians, we are super excited for this one and your time is very appreciated. Thank, Thank you for having us. Me. Thank yeah. you both so much. Jennifer, good luck with it. And you, it was an honor to meet you, David. It's always an honor to have you participate in any of our programming. Thank you, Kelly, we for having me. Thank you both me. so much. And thanks, thanks everybody for tuning in. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you and thanks. Bye. All right, I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, let you guys um, escape from us. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day. You too. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye. So we're just going to um, for the rest of you on the um, that are still here. We just want to remind you that um, we have, of course, as always. Um, hold on. Let me just. Another uh, more books that we'll be sending in our wrap up report. Sorry for some of the technical delays today, but we have a um, that was amazing. Miriam, was it not? Really? <laughs> so much. Uh, it was captivating. Um, and, you know, it, it's a wonderful reminder that we thank all the librarians for what they do, because books like this would not be possible without somebody that's guarding these records and, and keeping such good track of these archives that that make people who they are. It, it's it's fascinating. Um, so we won't take up any more of your time. We know we're a little over. We think that was worth being over for, but 
uh, we want to remind you that we have lots of other titles that celebrate the performing arts um, and something that we were very happy to, to, to do today was celebrate the performing arts. This will be in your wrap up report. There's a URL on the bottom that has a bunch of titles for you. And then also we have a bunch of really just wonderful um, ballet titles as well. So we thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, there's some audio titles. Oh, sorry, I'll give, well, there's some audio titles as well for the performing arts. And of course, again, this will all be in the wrap up. And our next episode will be in October already, which sounds far away, but it'll be like that. Uh, and it'll be a cookbook and culinary stories edition. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Miriam, thank you for helping to put that together. That was great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kelly. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Take care.